Hi, I'm Dr. Stuart Miniker. I'm a family doctor at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Los Gatos Center. Welcome to Health Connections on KCAT Television, Los Gatos Montessorino. On today's episode, we're going to talk about plastic surgery with my colleague, Dr. John Talley. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. We're going to head inside and sit down and chat. Come with us. So John, thanks again for joining us today on Health Connections. Tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would, please. Thanks for having me here today. I grew up in Arizona, and then I trained in plastic surgery at Stanford, and <clears throat> then I joined the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and I'm a cosmetic and reconstructive plastic surgeon. Great, we're very happy to have you here at Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Tell us a little bit about why did you decide to be a plastic surgeon? I always had an interest in, in surgery. I grew up on a farm and uh, always worked with my hands and, and then became interested in biology and, and the human body and was headed towards surgery. But it wasn't until later in medical school that I, I worked with a, a very well-known plastic surgeon named Dr. Fred Minnick who was world famous for face and nose reconstruction. And I, it was more out of curiosity that I, that I went to, to spend time with him. And when I, I did, I saw him, it was actually the very first case that I saw, he was doing complex nose reconstruction for cancer. And basically, I saw him create this nose out of essentially nothing other than other, using other parts of the human body to make it, and cartilage and skin. And so it struck me as unbelievable talent to, to be able to do that. And so that kind of propelled me into the world of plastic surgery. And I learned more about it and learned that there was a lot more to it, including the cosmetics, the surgery, as well as the reconstructive surgery. That yeah, sounds fascinating. So how about some of the differences between cosmetic surgery reconstructive? I think most people think of a plastic surgeon and they think about nose jobs and breast cancer surgery or breast augmentation. But there's a lot more to what you do than just those things. Plastic surgery has, um, has been around for a long time. In fact, there's actually recordings of medical plastic surgery procedures done in, in India around 800 BC. Um, the writings of Shashruta demonstrate that uh, they were even doing nose surgery at that time. Um, and there's other historical writings that, it, so it's been around a long time. There was a lull in it for a while in terms of what was being published. And then, and so people have probably been doing variations of cosmetic and reconstructive surgery throughout the last several thousand years. But it really started to become a specialty in and of itself in the, in the, um, the late 1800s and the early 1900s, especially around the time of World War I, where there was a lot of trench warfare and people were getting shot in the, uh, the head as they peeked out over the trenches. And so the, that kind of became this an opportunity for Sir Harold Gillies out of the UK to start doing really complex reconstruction. And that is kind of, because of the wars, that is really where plastic surgery kind of came into its own. Um, there was this tremendous need for all these people that had all these traumatic defects and they were looking for ways to fix them. And also around that time, they, were, they actually were even doing some cosmetic procedures like facelifts or breast augmentation in a very rudimentary, rudimentary form. So the difference, uh, uh, you asked you know, the difference between cosmetic and reconstructive surgery, it's really on a spectrum. Anything that, you, that a patient may not like that may bother one patient and may not bother another patient. Sometimes if somebody has cancer in their ear, it bothers someone and, uh, and, you know, after it's been cut off. And sometimes patients, it doesn't bother them so much. And, and if somebody has um, breasts that they want larger, um, that may bother one woman and it may not bother another one. And so it's really a very personal preference as to who obtains cosmetic surgery or even reconstructive surgery. And we basically are available to kind of guide a patient through that, that process and explain to them what we are able to do and what we're not able to do. And it's a very personal decision. So it's great that they have someone like you to guide through decision-making process, but who comes to see you? I mean, is there an age limit? Is it men, women? Who should see a plastic surgeon? We as plastic surgeons, we train in, in all ages from infants on to older patients. So we, 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 we take care of all ages and we take care of some key categories, things like congenital deformities that, ch that children can have. Usually those are taken care of when they're young, but sometimes people present much later with those when they're older because they've never had them taken care of. Things like cleft lip and palate, those are kind of the, the classic congenital deformities that we take care of um, as children. And they have a lot of issues that require multiple surgeries uh, throughout their childhood, all the way up until the age of 18. 
that's a, that's a big area, congenital deformities or defects. And then other areas are include um, burns, when people get severely burned. Both general surgeons and plastic surgeons um, work together to take care of burn victims. Those are very severely sick patients at times, but require putting skin onto the burned areas where they're missing skin. Um, and then uh, there's people that have that come to us that just want something done, um, they don't like the way their nose looks, the, their eyelids have too much extra skin on them, or their face has dropped a little bit as they become older, and we help th um, those patients that have purely cosmetic needs or desires. And we operate head to toe. Anywhere on the body where there's a problem, we uh, usually can come up with some sort of solution to fix and what's abnormal, and our goal is to try and make it look normal as much as possible. And that includes things from trauma or cancer, so car accidents, um, or cancer in particular, those are two of the big things that we are uh, often asked to help fix. Let's talk a little bit for our viewers about some of the specific procedures that you perform to help people out. As you said, perhaps a little bit artificial, but let's divide uh, and talk first about some of the cosmetic procedures, and then we'll come to some reconstruction a little bit later on in our conversation. Sure. Uh, so what's the most common thing you see folks for that would be a cosmetic procedure? The most common thing would be breast um, surgery. And there are a lot of different breast surgeries that we do. I'll just kind of go through them in general. One is if people have breasts that they feel are too small, don't fit their, their body frame, and they want them to, be, to match their body a little bit better. We do breast augmentation, make the breasts bigger. That's done with an implant. Then there's sometimes women that have breasts that are just too large, and that can cause back and neck pain, and we make those breasts smaller. It's actually one of the, uh, one of the surgeries with one of the highest satisfaction rates. It is with the highest satisfaction rate within plastic surgery because those women get tremendous relief from these large breasts that really create a considerable about, amount of pain in the neck and um, back region. They are very happy after the surgery. Other breast surgeries would be uh, things like, as we age, our breasts tend to drop, and, and we lift those breasts and put them up back where they were when they were younger. So really, breast surgery is a, tr is, is a big area within cosmetic surgery, but of course we also have breast reconstruction. That's a whole separate category. Okay. John, how about nose surgery and other facial surgery that would be cosmetic? Yeah, so some of the very common facial surgeries that, that, that we do that are cosmetic include things like facelift, where we help to decrease the wrinkles and the heaviness in a face, and in the neck region, where we lift the skin and tighten it up. And with you know, the goal of making a face look a little bit more youthful. The other thing that would be very common would be to do a rhinoplasty, and that's reshaping the nose. Um, various parts of the nose may have um, some areas like a, a hump on the nose that uh, people don't like, and, and that, that can be made less prominent. And then just reshaping the, the tip of the nose. Um, the, the, in general, the people, those are the two areas that people are concerned about. And then the other thing that would probably be the most common would be just upper eyelid skin. If there's too much upper eyelid skin, one, that can actually affect your visual fields and kind of block your ability to see peripherally. That's one thing. But then also if it's just too much skin and people don't like the way, the way that their eyes look in terms of being tired, it's a common complaint that they feel that they look tired, that we take that extra skin off. So those are probably kind of three very common ones. Okay. And is everything you do on the face, is it surgical? Not everything we do. Two of the um, two of the very popular things that are that we, that aren't surgery are Botox. I think everyone's heard about Botox, and, and then the other category is this thing called fillers. Botox works by paralyzing muscles. It's actually a toxin. It's a neurotoxin, and it, it prevents the muscles from moving in that particular area. So what it does is, often muscles are contracted, and as they contract, they make wrinkles. If I kind of frown at you here, I make some wrinkles. And so we can put Botox in that area and that stops those wrinkles from happening. You won't actually be able to frown. Um, sometimes you, you can put a little less in and, give a, and allow people to frown a little bit or raise their uh, um, forehead a little bit, but overall smooth out the, the wrinkles. And that, but that only lasts about four months and you have to come back and do that again. The other thing that we do is a thing called fillers and there's a, a variety of those and we won't go into all of those because it gets extremely detailed, but the basic concept is that some people want their lips to be a little bit more full or certain creases to kind of be more smooth. And fillers can help do that. Fillers are not a cure-all. They work 
for certain people in certain situations, and but they they're not a substitute for something that may really actually require surgery. Let me ask a little bit about uh, reconstructive surgery and. Again, as you mentioned, sometimes the line is a little bit blurred. I have some patients who've lost lots and lots of weight and have uh, excess fat they want removed. And from one perspective, we think that's cosmetic, but that's a big surgery that is reconstructive too. So tell us a little bit about some common reconstructive surgeries, how they go, and who might need them. Well, uh, there are two main reasons that people uh, re ultimately uh, require reconstructive surgery. One of the big categories is cancer, and that includes cancer in a lot of different places of, of the body, head to toe. And if a cancer occurs anywhere in the body, and if it has to be cut out, that sometimes leaves quite a large, essentially, hole or defect in the skin and maybe even the underlying tissues. So that's one big category. And the other is trauma. Car accidents uh, create broken bones that then create the loss of the skin overlying those bones, and then that has to be covered with new tissue. With regards to cancer, I think one of the things that we all are probably familiar with, either with your own relatives or, uh, or personal experience is breast cancer. And breast reconstruction is a very, very large part of our practice. It's a very complicated part of our practice because uh, there's a lot involved. Every Although a woman has breast cancer, it, uh, where that cancer is located, what other treatment she needs, such as chemotherapy and radiation, and the surgery that's ultimately performed to take out that cancer, that all affects how we reconstruct the breast. And so there's essentially two general ways that we can make a, a new breast after breast cancer. One is with an implant, and the other is, is using your own tissue from somewhere else in your body, usually from the abdomen, taking some of that abdominal tissue and essentially transplanting it up onto the, to the chest and connecting blood vessels to help that tissue survive allows someone to uh, use their own tissue to make a new breast without an implant. So there, those are two options and it dep there's a lot of things that go into those into deciding how um, we make that decision as to whether we use an implant or whether we use their own tissue and that's partly personal preference. It's also, uh, it just also depends on how, what, what is actually available to be used uh, from the patient's body. We talked some before about the fact that plastic surgery can be appropriate for people of all ages. You spoke some about facial reconstruction, cleft lip, and cleft palate. Are there other common procedures in children? A couple of the areas that we see very frequently are things like uh, hemangiomas, it's a vascular tumor, and those can grow in various places uh, on the body, as well as other vas what we call vascular malformations, and some of those get really, really complex. They're a tumor that grows and then they, then they become smaller over time. We treat them with medications to try and prevent them from getting larger, but then often there's a residual area that, that doesn't look normal, and so then that requires us often to take that, that area away. Another um, pediatric issue is what we call prominent ears. Often children with ears that are prominent, they, they often can be teased pretty heavily at school and, and bullied uh, and made fun of, and it becomes a source of ridicule. And around the age of seven, ears are essentially full grown in children. And we are able to then do a, a procedure whereby we're able to reshape the ear and put it in a better position relative to the head so, this does, that it does, so it doesn't stick out as much. And children do very well with that. John, I know there must have been any number of surgeries you performed where the outcome has made a big difference in someone's life. Can you tell me a story about one time when the way you've helped someone surgically has made a difference in how they feel about themselves or how their life has gone? It's very humbling to watch uh, and see the, the, the patients that, that come in to, to see me or that I've seen over the years the things that they've had to live with and their tremendous courage and ability to kind of cope with these difficulties and, and then for us to be able to help them is just such a great feeling. Um, there's one in particular, I, uh, a few years ago I had the opportunity to um, go to, to Cambodia with um, Research International and we, we treated mostly children and there was a lot of, there's a lot of burns that occur in the developing world and w one of those was about a 12 year old girl who had had a burn and in, in here in the United States those burns get treated very early on and aggressively they go to a burn center they get splints and if they need skin grafting they get it done right away but in, a, in other developing countries that doesn't always happen so sometimes those burns just heal by just scarring and she was a very active intelligent 
well-developed child, but her right hand was not essentially non-functional because she'd had a burn on the, on the side of her hand and it pulled her hand into such a deformed position that she was not able to use it appropriately. And really it's quite simple what we did, but ultimately very profound for the, for the little girl. And, and that was just to release the scar and then put a skin graft there. Her hand works, it, 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 it's a totally functional hand, but because of that simple contracture there from the burn and the scar over the years, um, she wasn't able to use it right. And so by doing, by just that simple release and putting a simple skin graft there, it really changed her life. And, and she's you know, able, now able to use her hand in a very normal fashion. And so that's uh, extremely f fulfilling to me to be able to do something that, that's overall really simple, but, but that the patient, it changes their life. That's a great story. One thing that uh, we haven't talked about so far, John, is scars. So a lot of folks have scars from accidents or injuries, yeah. or maybe they're someone whose skin type uh, creates very large, more worrisome scars. But uh, I'm sure you can help those people some. Can you tell me about uh, what you can offer and also about how people can help manage their injuries and wounds to reduce scarring? That's a big area. Um, in in plastic surgery, dermatology, really almost every doctor has to deal with that. I mean, I'm sure you've been asked by your patients, oh, I have this, I have this here, what, what can I do about it? This scar, it doesn't look the way I want it to look. Everyone scars differently. And some people form great scars and some people form not so great scars. And, and there's a bunch of factors that go into that. Once somebody does have a scar, depending on the scar, uh, there are things we can do early on where we have people, we do know there's a few things that do work such as massage the scar, avoidance of sun, making sure that that's protected with sunscreen for at least the first year. And the other thing that's been shown to make a difference is what we call silicone sheeting, putting silicone on top of a scar, it's a, a thin sheet. We don't understand the mechanism as to why that works, but it does seem to help um, with uh, controlling the thickness of the scars. Widening of scars occurs for a number of reasons, and that's usually due to tension. And so our goal is plastic surgeons, we don't, we don't ever want skin that's together to be on tension because that kind of wants to pull apart and it can make the scar wider. Then ultimately if those things don't work, we can talk about revising some scars depending on the situation with surgery. And sometimes cutting out the old scar and putting the skin back together it allows it to heal for whatever reason, we don't fully understand, it allows it to heal better and the scar can be less. It depends, but uh, there are definitely both non-surgical and some surgical things that we can do to reduce scars. But a lot of it is, is prevention, with avoiding, it, avoiding the sun on the scar immediately after is very important. Well, it sounds to me, John, like a lot of the procedures you do, particularly on the face, are related to sun damage and other things that are potentially preventable. So do you have any not that you want to lose the business, I'm sure you'd be happy to help people with uh, all of their needs, but are there things that some of our patients can do that might prevent the wrinkles or folds or other changes in their skin that sometimes you have to fix later on? We do know that there are some external factors, such as sun damage, that affect our skin. But there's also actually a, a large part of how we age is really related to our genetics. We don't have a whole lot of control over that. While there are things that we can do, do to mitigate the aging process, such as wrinkles, wrinkles and, and sun damage to our skin, and some, some of that we don't have as much control over. The things that we do have control over are avo avoiding sun, uh, placing sunscreen on um, whenever we're out in the sun for extended periods of time, because that does, that does damage the skin over time, and it increases our risk of skin cancer, which if we develop skin cancer, then that leads to the need to cut that skin cancer out, which creates problems. There are a lot of facial care products on the market. When we look at those and we realize that there are hundreds, it's probably because we haven't come up with one that really, really works. And so we do know that some things help. Um, moisture, moisturizers definitely help um, the skin to stay kind of full and, and have a better, a better appearance to them. We don't have a, a great solution in terms of things that we can apply to the face that really make everything better but also things like smoking really affects the quality of our tissue over time as well. But not in everyone, um, but it just, once again, depends on your genetic makeup. But smoking in general is terrible and ultimately leads to other problems aside from the aging of your skin. Well, so we're not giving permission to anyone to smoke, no matter what your genetic make makeup is. And especially, I would think, John, smoking is probably not good after surgery. 
You're absolutely right. Patients that are smoking, depending on what the surgery is that we're doing, we just can't do the surgery if they're smoking. It, the, the risks are too high. We count on blood supply to the tissues that we're moving around. And if that tissue doesn't have good blood supply, and that blood supply can be decreased when people are smoking, that puts everything at risk. Things such as poor wound healing or death to the tissues that we're working with. So it's very important that patients stop smoking prior to any sort of surgery, and we talk to them about that. So all of you folks who are thinking about plastic surgery, make sure you talk to your primary care doc about how to quit smoking first. Then I'm sure Dr. Talley would be happy to help you. Absolutely. So John, I know that sometimes my patients are a little bit afraid of surgery. And you probably see folks who come to talk to you and are worried they'd like to have something changed a little bit, but are afraid that they won't have a good outcome or that surgery is dangerous. What would you say to those people? When I sit and talk with my patients, we have very frank conversations about what is all involved in the surgery, what to expect prior to surgery, during the operation, and after the operation. And we talk about what you know, sort of the expected outcome can be, um, the improvements that we can make. I let them know that they'll still look like themselves, but the goal is to have an, an improvement in their appearance. And I tell them that surgery is definitely not to be taken lightly, but we do everything to make sure that they have a comfortable and safe experience. We have unbelievably trained staff that, at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, along with our facilities and our equipment that's just phenomenal. And the support I get from the Palo Alto Medical Foundation is paramount to creating an overall safe experience for the patient. And I'm with the patient every step of the way. And so I think that, that that's the key thing to helping someone make a, a decision about um, whether or not to have cosmetic surgery. That's yeah. very reassuring. I like the fact that you say you're with the patient every step of the way. I think uh, Dr. Talley, like all of our doctors at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, think that patient safety, comfort, and great outcomes, best quality care are the most important thing we can do. When you see folks who come to your office, how do you help manage their expectations of surgery, uh, what you can do to help them, and the outcomes? So I wouldn't come to see you expecting to come out looking like Brad Pitt, but what could you offer to me? That is one of the key things. When, when I talk to patients, we, all, we have to be on the same page. One, what I'm able to offer has to match with what the patient wants and, is, and, and ultimately I need to come to an understanding what the patient's expected outcome is. And that requires a conversation, and it just requires having, uh, asking some questions, listening, and understanding exactly what they are trying to accomplish. We talked about earlier about the, how this is a very personal decision, and these decisions should be made for the right reasons. I think that that's probably the, one of the biggest things. Um, it shouldn't be made because somebody else wants you to have it done or because you think that it's going to also make you a Hollywood actor or actress. It should be done because it's something you've really thought about and feel strongly about. It should always be done understanding that there are limitations as to what we are able to accomplish. So depending on what, the, what procedure or what concern the patient has, some things are very simple and some things are more complex. But our, our goal is to, to our, the best of our ability, and we sometimes use photographs, take photographs of the patients before, right after their surgery, and then, and then later on. That's very helpful. We sometimes use other imaging modalities to help kind of plan the surgery ahead of time. So, and, and there's some systems where we can kind of upfront show the patients such things such as Photoshop where we adjust things and then show them a picture, okay, this is what we think we can accomplish in a range. And that's very helpful to kind of talk through those things and show them what we are um, able to accomplish. And I also explain to the patient that there's gonna be a period of time right after surgery where things are not gonna look what they look like, what we ultimately plan for them to look like. They're gonna be swollen and that swelling's gonna have to go down and the tissues will have to settle and, and, and heal. And as they do that, they move into different positions and that's all part of normal healing. And then, and then ultimately about a year is kind of when we think everything is fully settled out and that's what their final result would be. So it is a process. It's a matter of us being on the same page and so this requires some conversation, some just real honest conversation with each other, the patient and myself. So John, when patients have plastic surgery, what can they expect in terms of time in the operating room or at the operating uh, facility, the hospital, the surgery center, and uh, about recovery? It depends on the surgery. If it is Often a lot of our surgeries are what we call outpatient surgery, which means that you come in the same day and you go home the same day, provided everything is, you, know, you're, you do well, which most 
patients do and they go home. And, and if that's the case, um, we, we, we do those surgeries at our Palo Alto Medical Foundation uh, surgery centers. And patients come in and they get checked in and then the surgery is performed and once they, after the surgery, they wake up, they, they go home and our nurses help to take care of um, them throughout that whole process. After, after um, waking up from surgery and, and, uh, and going home, we always call the patient night of surgery and, and make sure that they're doing well. And then they follow up usually in one to two weeks, depending on, on, on the surgery that was performed. And most patients are, uh, can often go back to work uh, after about a week. And that's, and that's true for patients that have had procedures that are, that are fairly straightforward. The more complex um, uh, procedures, and it would depend on the procedure, can, can sometimes take a, a little bit longer, uh, upwards of, of two to three weeks before they're kind of feeling back to, to, to normal. But my patients I see often, uh, a lot of them like to work out and, and, and do yoga and Pilates. And, and so I, in terms of aerobic or, or cardiovascular type activities, I let patients go back to those usually around two weeks. In weightlifting, we say four weeks. People often don't want to get away from their exercise regimen um, to, uh, for surgery. So, uh, but it's, it's not too much time that they have to take away, and people usually do pretty well. So I'd, I'd like to ask a little bit about trends in plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. I know that many countries around the world, I think a lot about Latin America, plastic surgery is very common, mm -hmm. and a large percentage of the population has had plastic surgery of one kind or another. Why isn't that the case here in the U.S.? And who's getting plastic surgery here? for cosmetic issues? Uh, we, we are seeing changes in, in the trends and, and their quest for types of plastic surgery. Some of those are fueled uh, actually out of Latin America. Um, one of the things that we're seeing a lot more than we ever used to in the, in the female population, which is a butt, um, buttock augmentation or the request for buttock augmentation. And that's, that's, that's kind of new and that I think has been fueled a little bit out of Latin America. The other area that, it, that is somewhat interesting is historically more female patients have come for plastic surgery, but we are seeing more and more male patients. And the male population is, is interested in, in things like liposuction, which can take away some of the fat. And they all have, they're usually asking for removal of the fat around kind of the, the midriff region. That's one area that's had an increased number of requests. The other area would be uh, facelifts are also done in men and becoming probably more requested than, than they used to be, for sure. So I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us today on Health Connections and thank my guest, Dr. John Talley, for Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Palo Alto Medical Foundation. As hopefully you've heard, Dr. Talley's specialty is more than about cosmetics. It's about how we feel about ourselves. It's about changing lives, helping everyone feel like they're the person on the outside that they know they are on the inside. All of us, primary care and all of our specialists at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, love the chance to help each of you, our patients, reach your potential in life and stay healthy. So join us again next time on Health Connections on KCAT Television, Los Gatos, Monte Sereno, and learn more about what we have to offer at Palo Alto Medical Foundation here in Los Gatos.